And we are live on an incredible Friday afternoon. Here I am with my dear friend, Steve Ray, and we're going to be talking about all things Mariological, Mariology, the Virgin Mary in the Old Testament, typology carried on over into the New Testament. There is a ton that can we, really, we can really talk about tonight. We're going to unveil a lot of stuff that perhaps maybe you haven't heard about of, but you're going to definitely hear a lot and you're going to learn a lot because my, my, my dear brother, Steve, uh, has been doing this for a really long time. We're blessed to have him here. Steve, before we even begin, how are you doing, brother? Doing good. Uh, looking great there, brother. Thank you. Just lost 22 pounds. Uh, still uh, still jogging a little bit? I can't do that anymore because of the knees. I wore my knees out. I'm 66. I ran too many miles in my life. So now I, I'm stuck with the elliptical every day and uh, long walks. Hey, that's good, though. Very healthy for the heart. Yep. So I see we have a number of people watching. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we're going to unpack, uh, and in fact, in, in, a, in a moment or two, I am going to share on the screen for you notes that we're going to be following as we look at Mary as, well, actually not Mary, not only Mary as a new Eve, but a, a bunch of stuff really uh, Mariology related because the one thing that I always really like focusing on, uh, Steve, and I don't know about you, but um, I'm going to briefly share this screen. People will be able to watch and everybody can, can see these notes, by the way, everybody, they've been compiled by Steve. We're going to follow along with an outline so that we can all be in the same page. There's really a lot about our Immaculate Mother that can be found in Holy Red. Uh, did it, when you first came over into Catholicism, Steve, were you kind of a bit maybe shocked that there was so much about Mary that you could find in the Old Testament? Well, to be honest with you, I have to say that I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than I did from the New Testament. Yeah. And I, I, it really, uh, the whole idea of Mary and her place in the church and salvation history and her importance, which we denied as Protestants, it all became clear to me from the Old Testament more so than the New Testament. Yeah, the, the, there, there's really no doubt about that. Really, um, there is a lot that we can really learn about Mary from the Old Testament. The one thing that I that really shocks me and before uh, actually it's connected right in with the uh, the new eve typology the fact that mary is that new eve the fulfillment come to fruition in the new testament but the one thing that really blows me away steve still to this day um because i do a lot of research into mariology as you know is that as early as the book of genesis when we hear about the coming messiah that will come uh, he will be the Messiah prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Yeah. Immediately once you hear, you have that incredible prophecy about the Messiah that will come. You also have a prophecy about the mother of the Messiah. Isn't it incredible how from the very beginning, our Immaculate Mother and her son are so connected in salvation history that it is no wonder that the early fathers had such incredible honor and veneration for her. You can see the, the Genesis 3.15 there, the um, I'll bring enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he'll crush your head and he'll bruise his heel. You can see that in Mel Gibson's movie. I always love watching the devil. He's always watching Mary. If you watch even through a crowd, he's walking through the crowd, the devil is, and he's got his eye on Mary. He never, he's wondering, what, it, what does that woman know? What power does she have is that the one that was referring to back in genesis and he doesn't he doesn't like her at all <laughs> no he, he but, really doesn't no but this is what what you see on the screen now two sinless atoms i wrote that one time when i was just thinking it's not about mary so much as jesus and the reason that we even get the idea of mary being the second eve is because in first corinthians 15 paul says that jesus is the last adam there's one adam in a garden at a tree of life and he brought about death now there's a new Adam in a tree of at a tree of death, and he brings about life. It's the opposite. Both are in a garden. That's why John wants you to know that not only was Gethsemane, where the sins came upon Jesus, in a garden. The whole passion starts in a garden. But I love to tell people this when we're on our pilgrimages. But John 
makes a point of telling you that the cross and the tomb were also in a garden. And if you miss it, he makes sure you know it because he then has Mary Magdalene think that the that Jesus is the gardener. So you know that you're dealing with a garden because the new Adam is in a new garden at another tree and the whole story is being rewound like a video. <laughs> like a video going backwards to rewind. It's called recapitulation where the first Adam and Eve brought who are to be the, the founders of the human race, and they were, but they brought sin, and now we have new founders that are starting out and bringing a new creation, which is a new heavenly reality, and that's, uh, and it's no longer a husband and a wife, it's now a mother with her son, and it's really quite profound. So that whole thing there with two sinless atoms approached by the devil, struggle in two gardens at two trees, experience two deaths because of one sin. I just love the parallelism. Adam's disobedience at the tree of life brought about death, but Jesus' obedience at the tree of death brought about life. Adam was naked without shame and because of sin had to be clothed. Jesus was clothed, but to pay the price for sin, he had to be stripped naked and shamed. You know, that's interesting. You think that, uh, that um, Adam and Eve were naked in their innocence, but they had to be clothed and kicked out of the garden because of sin. Jesus was in clothes outside, but in order to re recapitulate he had to come in and be naked at the tree now to restore the innocence all of those things just fit together so how the first adam was separated mankind from god the last adam hung between heaven and earth as mediator to bring god and man back together again now this is there about jesus but it all is there because when we think about him being the second or the last adam the question comes in then well where's the the last eve where's the second eve the new eve well, it's obvious that Eve and um, Adam and Eve were standing at the foot of the tree in the garden, and the new Adam and Eve are at the foot of the tree in another garden. Mary's right there at Jesus's side at the tree of uh, death in the garden of, uh, of Calvary. So yeah. this is where the fathers of the church, really, I think it, it was so clear. And because now, if we see what you've got on the screen now, what I've made there was the early fathers, the very first writers of the Catholic, you look there, Tertullian, he's, yeah. he's early. Justin Martyr, he's in the second century. Irenaeus, he's in the second century. These guys are very early on. In fact, if you take Irenaeus, he was taught by Polycarp, who was taught by John, who was taught by Jesus. So if you go genealogy-wise, in the tradition handed down, Jesus taught John, John taught Polycarp, Polycarp, taught Irenaeus, and they all said, and many others too, that Mary was the new Eve. The Eve in the garden tied the knot of sin. The new Eve, she untied the knot. This is my wife's favorite devotion. Now, I, I'm going to get a picture of it. While we're Beautiful library. Here. And uh, I don't know if you can see it because I know oh, we yeah. got the words up there. No, no, it, it looks wonderful. Yeah, definitely. And in fact, um, see it on the I'm, I'm going to briefly make it large so everybody can see it. That is my wife's favorite devotion, Mary, the untire of knots. This is Mary, the new Eve, because the first Eve, she tied the knot of sin. She got us all tangled up in a big mess. <laughs> the new Eve, she comes in and she unties the knot of sin. She cooperates in the redemption, just like Eve cooperated in the condemnation. Yep. And so you have Eve, the untire of knots. So these fathers of the church, what, what really impressed me was that, and, and this came from a book, as long as I got here, another book that people, I, I would get a hold of. It's um, a compilation of quotes from Cardinal John Henry Newman. And it's a beautiful book, so small, easy to read, right? Well, that is the book that really flipped the switch for me as a Protestant coming into the church on the issues of Mary. And it was partly what you have, uh, what you have on the screen there, that these guys were from three opposite ends of the Roman Empire, very early in the church. And that's before they had telephones and Zoom broadcasts and texting. So information spread much slower. And these guys were not starting a novelty like I have there. They, they weren't coming up with, hey, let's start a new idea. They were very conservative. They didn't come up with novelties. They only taught what the apostles taught them, the deposit of faith. 
So if you've got three guys like Tertullian from North Africa, Justin from Palestine, and I only say that because by then it was called Palestine, not until the second century. That word comes from Philistine, so I don't use it any more than I have to. But uh, Justin comes from the area of Nablus in Israel. And Irenaeus is way up north in Gaul, which is France. So you've got these three guys from these three very different areas referring to Eve as the as Mary as the new Eve, fulfilling that typology. And you have that as though it's been taught from the beginning. It's not that they're starting something new. Three guys from the opposite corners of the Roman Empire are saying the same thing as though it is the known orthodox teaching. And if that's the case, it has to be apostolic. I said, how could these guys all come up with that beautiful typology there and uh, at ends different corners of the known world at the time? So that was something that really impacted me. And these guys were not coming up with new ideas. They were very conservative. Their whole goal was to preserve what the apostles had taught. Now, Steve, you bring up a really good point, actually, in my opinion, a fantastic point, that you've got uh, Tertullian, Justin the Martyr, and Irenaeus, and you've got individuals from different parts of the globe. To me, that lends incredible credence to the fact that within Catholicism, we talk about the ancient deposit of faith. And indeed, it wouldn't be true if we wouldn't be able to find evidence from the whole world of Christianity. Yet when we look at the Christian world, you can go to any part of the world. You can go to North Africa, Rome, even, even, uh, even the Syriac fathers, which we haven't even gotten the chance to go into yet. And they're all teaching virtually the very same thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, to me, that's mind blowing. That says one thing that says that Christ meant it. He meant his words when he said he would never let the, the gates of hell prevail over the church. And the apostles did one heck of a job as they were being martyred and as they were being murdered and as they were on the run, as you know very well, because you are a tour guide extraordinaire. You give tour guides to the Holy Land and all of these areas, don't you? Oh, I do. I love to do it. We got eight trips going again next year. We just had five people sign up for trips this week and we're filling up our buses again for next year. So I hope you can join us. Real Amen. quick, as long as I get this little advertisement here, five times we're taking groups to Israel and the Holy Land. Uh, we got one trip going on a St. Paul cruise, 10 biblical sites, Philippi, Thessalonica, uh, Turk, uh, all in Turkey, Ephesus and Pergamum and Island, apart most other places, 10 of them. And we also are going to Ireland and we're going to Lourdes and Fatima. We're going to go up through Portugal, Spain and France. Wow. So, now, uh, uh, an another to put another quick plug in there for you, do you ever go to any ancient areas that people would have believed Mary would have lived in or visited it? Oh, even uh, in the Holy Land, yes. We follow the whole life of Mary. We pray every mystery of the rosary where it happened. So you are following the whole life of Mary through the rosary. The rosary is our itinerary through Israel. But also on a St. Paul cruise, we're going to Ephesus where Mary lived with John. We're going to the island of Patmos, where the book of Revelation was written, where he saw her as the queen of heaven, which we'll get to if we have time today in Revelation chapter 12, 1. So we go to a lot of places related to Mary and Paul and Jesus and Peter, all these guys, all these people. The one thing that I have noticed, Steve, and I've looked um, at a lot of fathers, and I'm talking about tons of them, when it comes to the new Eva parallelism, the fact that they... When you look at the early church fathers, what I have noticed is even if you have one father that may give an exegesis of Genesis 3 and maybe not mention Mary, that very same father will come back in a later work and provide the exegesis and broaden and include Mary. Uh, every father recognized that Mary was the woman there. And he, even, even a figure who as you know, ended, ended his life in controversy, even a figure such as Tertullian recognized. I mean, look at what he says here. For it was while Eve was yet a virgin that the ensnaring word had crept into her ear, which was to build the edifice of death into a virgin soul in like manner must be introduced at Logos, the word of God. And then we got it right here. As Eve had believed the serpent, so Mary believed the angel. 
the delinquency which the one occasioned by believing, the other by believing Ephist. Yeah. I mean, people scroll recognize their incredible scroll, words. Scroll up a little more so you can see the image there. Uh, sorry, I got the words off a little bit on the right, but but this is, I think, a great image. And you have two immaculate conceived virgins here. And people say, well, why is it necessary that Mary was the immaculate conception? Why was it important she was a virgin? Well, because the parallelism is so clear. When you have the one on the left here, it look at wrapped around her leg is the serpent, and in her hand is the fruit. We don't know what the fruit was. The Jewish rabbis generally tend to think that the fruit was a pomegranate. Uh, there's no reason to believe it was an apple. That's a, probably a European idea, but a pomegranate may have very well been what it is. That's a biblical fruit. But this here you see Mary uh, is consoling Eve. And Eve has the devil wrapped around her leg, pulling her down. And she's holding that fruit in her hand. And she is blushing with the shame of her sin. And now you've got the new Eve, who is also immaculately conceived. Let's face it, Eve in the Garden of Eden was immaculately conceived. God conceived of her immaculately, and she was born without sin. Yep. Now the new Eve is also born without sin, immaculate conception, so that she can parallel the first Eve and have and start all over again. And so there she is directing Eve with her long red hair there, to put her hand on her tummy to say, here is the new Adam and he's coming to redeem you. Now there's also great artwork of Jesus taking Mary and uh, Adam out of their graves. There's a great church, it's called the Coral Church in Istanbul. It's ancient, ancient church with these old uh, paintings on the wall, frescoes. And it shows Jesus taking by hand and pulling Adam and Eve up out of the graves. And Eve has her right hand covered with a red cloth because she's ashamed that that hand was the one that reached up and took the fruit. And it's, we don't realize this, but Adam and Eve are saints, according to the church, and their yep. feast day is December 24th, Christmas Eve before Jesus is born. That, that, that is really incredible, incredible amount of information there, Steve. And the figure who we're, we're, we're moving to next is, is one that um, I believe just uh, was just declared a doctor of the church. Um, I, I wish he would have been declared a doctor a long time ago, but in the incredible St. Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, the words we've got at this period of time, as you know, we're reading a father that was writing in the second century. I don't know if people can really, really stop and wrap their, wrap their minds around it, but we're talking before the year 200. And look at what he's saying. The deception being done away with by which that virgin Eve, who was already a spouse to a man, was unhappily misled, was happily announced through means of the truth by the angel to the Virgin Mary, who was also a spouse to a man. So we clearly have um, a contrast, if you will. And the yeah. contrast is showing that there was that woman who was deceived, led into error. And then the other woman, the new Eve, the M Mary, our Immaculate Mother, is the woman who in Luke 1, she heard the word and she vouchsafed that Logos. And that is why she is such a crucial and focal figure in salvation history. Yep. Like you said, what impressed me, see, when I was becoming Catholic and researching, I didn't care what somebody said in the fifth or sixth or seventh century. Didn't impress me because that's a long way time to corrupt something. And I tried to find every argument and reason not to become a Catholic. But when I went back to the first and second century, those are the ones that I was concerned about. Irenaeus died before 200 or in 200, which means he was born just after the apostle John. So this is yep. very, very close. And he's up in Gaul. He's teaching, like I said earlier, what he already knows to be apostolic teaching. They're not trying to create new doctrines or to be clever. They're being very careful, which means that this must have been taught very early in the church. It must have been taught by the apostles themselves. And I love that towards the end of there, it's, you'd almost have it on. Uh, as the human race fell into bondage to death by means of a virgin, so it is rescued by a virgin. 
and it fell into race by a immaculate conception. So it was saved by an immaculate conception. You could put that in there as well. So now if you go, even the, even the, the catechism says, refers to the new Eve, the mother of the whole Christ. Now, the incredible thing about Irenaeus that you bring up is with Irenaeus, and I'd recommend people go look at the fragments of Irenaeus. In the, in the fragments, he talks about how uh, in his younger years, he recalls the great Bishop Polycarp uh, recounting to him yep. how he learned from the Apostle John, from St. John. So <laughs> what, do we, what do we have here, Steve? We've got an incredible apostolic chain that goes to the head to the earliest of eras, and we've got it all the way going to the time of Irenaeus. This is why when we talk about Catholicism, we can talk about that deposit of faith, that apostolic succession. Yep. Isn't that so crucial in grounding yourself in the faith? Well, it, let's face it. They didn't even have a New Testament for a final collected New Testament for 400 years. What did they go on? They went on the apostolic tradition. And you have Irenaeus saying that when I was a boy, I sat at the feet of Polycarp. And Polycarp told me all the things that John the Apostle had taught him. So that's like sitting there talking to your father about all the things your grandfather taught your father. That's very close. Yeah. That's, a, this is, that's the incredible nature of the tradition of the church. And that's why it was these kind of things that helped me to become a Catholic. They were so close to the time of the apostles that these must have been taught by the apostles. And so you have, let, let's just go a little further. Here. This is kind of fun because you're bringing up now the, the Eve, the mother of the church. A catechism refers to this, but I'm going to go even a little further to it. When I'm in um, the Holy Land with people and we go to the upper room. Yeah, you're getting there right now. Acts 115. How many were in the upper room? Well, I kind of gave it away there. <laughs> it says there were, now this is interesting, about 120 names. Now, most Bibles say a company of persons like this. I think this is the uh, English Standard Version Catholic edition. But when you read the margins or you look at it in the Greek, it doesn't say number of persons. It said there were about 120 names. Now, that's a strange way to say it. Like I'm on a bus with my groups of people. I'd say, well, William, there were 120 names on my bus this week. The bus only holds 50, so we have 50 names. Why does it say it that way? Well, when I go back and study the tradition of the Jews at the time of Christ, at the time of the upper room, it said that if you want to leave the big city, the big city has a civic structure. It has courts. It has legislature. It has a Sanhedrin, which is our courts. All of the things that have a governmental structure. If you are going to leave that, and go start your own new city outside with your own new governmental structure, you need 120 people. What's happening in the upper room? You have a new society starting, 120 names on a list, almost like we have a quorum. We now have the authority to leave and go start something else. What's it called? It's called the Ecclesia, the new Israel, which is the church. Now, where's Mary? It says that she's in the upper room with these 120 names. She's one of them. And why is she there? Because what's being, what happens on the day of Pentecost? Everybody knows that it's happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. It's the birthday of the church. And if it's the birthday, the, the body of Christ, which is the church is the body of Christ, who has to be there? The mother has to be there. Mary is the spiritual mother of the body of Christ, the church. Mary has to be there to give birth to the baby body of Christ. Simple as that. So Mary's in the upper room. Now it's starting a whole new thing. And Mary is the mother of the church. Even the fact that she's there on Pentecost proves that. Yeah, I totally agree. That is, that is very significant that we've got Mary there at Pentecost. But then we, we have a, a claim, unfortunately, levied by some um, within not, not all Protestants, because a lot of Protestants, uh, they, they recognize the importance of Mary, but then you have that other claim. And even if we don't get, get, have a chance to get to today, uh, we'll eventually, we'll, we'll do another show if we need to. 
people will say, well, after the book of Acts, Mary vanishes. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't, because you can find clear references to our Immaculate Mother in the book of Revelation. Clearly, you have Mary appearing there as the woman clothed with the sun in Revelation 12. But again, I'm getting, I'm getting a, a little bit ahead of myself. I'm looking here and I, I see one thing that I recognize it very, very much so. In the early fathers, you frequently have Mary referred to as the burning bush. And here's what the catechism says. She is the burning bush of the definitive theophany. Filled with the Holy Ghost, she makes the logos, the word, visible in the humility of his flesh. You have a number of fathers catching that typology. What does that mean there, Steve? Well, Moses came, oh, it says right there, Moses, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. I've been there. It's at the base of Mount Sinai. The burning bush is still there. It's in St. Catherine's Monastery. They've been preserving it for since the third 300s. And uh, the bush is the kind that if you burn one of those leaves, there's a combustible element in it, and poof, it'll just go up. I have some of those leaves in my library, in my museum here at home. The bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Think of Mary. She is on fire with the love of God, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, she, and she's not consumed by this. And the bush, God called out from the bush. The word of God came out of that burning bush. Well, what is Mary? She's the burning bush, and the word of God came out of her. So you also have now the burning bush, Mary, and the word of God comes out from her, and she's not consumed. And it's a holy place. I mean, you, Moses had to take his sandals off because it was holy ground. And the voice was, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses hid his face. He's afraid to look at God. And when people re recognized Mary as the all holy mother of God, the burning bush, God coming out of her, we should have the same respect. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. We also should respect the word of God coming out of Mary and have a similar kind of respect, not only for the word of God, but the bush as well. Fantastic. Great, great point there, there Stephen. That to me is particularly why we've got a number of fathers that make that connection. And then you've got it kind of exploding once we get to the medieval era. By the way, for, uh, for our uh, Eastern brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we recognize that the Immaculate Conception is a theol theologumenon, is a, um, a theological opinion that they may hold to. In fact, a number of their scholars do believe in the Immaculate Conception. But I bring up the, our Eastern brothers and sisters because a lot of the saints that they venerate captured that exact typology that we're looking at right now and viewed her as the burning bush of the definitive theophany. And now, now we, we move on to something that I know really, to me, it captivates me. And I know even a lot of Protestants recognize Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. What do we mean by that, Steve? And what implications does that carry? This one is a massive topic. I'll try to summarize it here. Exodus 40, this is where it begins. When Moses finished the work of the tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai, a cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He was not able to enter because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, when Mary heard in the Annunciation, how will this be, she says, how is this gonna happen? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come over you and that which is in you will be the Holy One of God. Actually, it's the Holy Thing of God. So what you have here is Mary, knowing her Bible, would have immediately said, oh my goodness, that's Exodus chapter 40. Because the same idea of the Holy Spirit overshadowing and then the glory of the Lord fills the temple. What is Jesus referred to in the Gospel of John? But the glory of God. You could see the glory of God. You could see this in Jesus. That's how the Gospel of John begins. And so you have Mary hearing that she's going to be overshadowed or will come upon which is the same thing it's the holy spirit will come come upon over you 
cover you, overshadow you, and that which is in you will be the Holy One of God. Well, look at this. What's, what's covering over the temple? It's the cloud. is The Holy Spirit is represented as a cloud over and over in the Bible. So this is saying that the Holy Spirit will, over cover, will overshadow, cover the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord, which is means Jesus himself, the glory, the presence of God will be in the tabernacle. So now the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow, come upon Mary, and Jesus is going to fill the tabernacle. Mary is that tabernacle. So Mary knew this when she heard this. The language would be understandable to her. It would be the same language. She, said, she would say to herself, a young girl, 15 years old, who knows the Bible, oh my goodness, I'm going to be the tent of the tabernacle. I know that story. My mom told me that story. I'm going to be filled with the glory of God. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit uh, is going to do. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow or come upon you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the son of God. The glory of the Lord shall be filling you, filling your, your womb. Now, that's the first thing. Now, before we go any further, I forgot to put this verse up in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, 4. Oh, boy, I'm going to have to look that up while we're working on this here. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I get the right verse. But it's um, it says that. Hebrews 4.12, maybe. I'll find it before we're done. Next time you're talking, I'll be looking. Okay, so it says that in the Ark of the Covenant, now, the, where does the Ark of the Covenant? I'm going to show you a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. All right. Here we go. Can, that, can people see this? I can't oh, yeah. see. I'm, I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to make it larger. One moment. Okay, because all I can see is the words. Okay, Ark of the Covenant. All right, I'm going to try to get this right. These are the Kohathites, and there were more of them, and they're carrying this box. Look at that. That's the box, the Ark of the Covenant. I just watched Indiana Jones the other night with the grandkids, and he was looking for this thing. Couldn't find it. So here's the Ark of the Covenant with the golden cherubim over top of it. Oh, by the way, didn't Beautiful. God says to make nothing, uh, any images? Oh, well, he just told them to make these golden angels uh, with the wings above them. And beautiful now, ones, too. They are. Oh, boy, they must have been beautiful. Now, inside of this box, which was about four feet long, two and a half feet tall, two and a half feet wide, inside of this box was placed the word of God on stone that was given to Moses, the tablets from Mount Sinai. He put those in here. It was big enough to hold those. Then he put in there also the manna from the wilderness, an urn with the manna from the wilderness. And there was a stick which represented the priest. Those three things. That's all. We're in this box. Very strange. Until you come to Mary now, and I tell people, this is my statue of Mary. They ask me, what is that on your desk? Oh, it's my statue of Mary. Why? Because Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. What's in Mary's womb? In Mary's womb is the Word of God inscribed not in flesh and not in a stone but in mary's womb is the word of god inscribed in flesh Amen. in mary's womb is not the manna which if you eat of it you will die in mary's womb is the word of god the is the bread of life john chapter 6 which comes down from heaven that if you eat of it you will never die and then you have also in mary not a stick which proves the priesthood in mary is the priest all of those things that were in the Ark of the Covenant are in Mary's womb. And she's on her way to Bethlehem. Why? Well, Bethlehem, it means house of bread. Mary's on her way to the house of bread to deliver the bread. In her is the bread of life. The word of God in stone, the bread of life, and the priest. So this is Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant. Now we get to... to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. But I first go to the visitation. And in the visitation, we, uh, I'm just going to list what happens there that is a significance here. Now, first of all, it's not about a young girl who goes to help her, her relative that we don't know if she was a cousin or an aunt or what she was. It just says a relative, kinswoman. And by the way, she was 100% Aaronic priesthood. John the Baptist has 100% priestly blood in his veins. I think Mary went there for a spiritual retreat. She went yep. there to get out of town figure out what to do with all of this and what's happening to her. She gets to Ein Kerem, which is where we go to pray the mystery of the rosary of the visitation, because that's where 
Elizabeth lived in the hill country of Judea. It says that Mary went to the hill country of Judea and Elizabeth met her and said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? John the Baptist was leaping in her womb. And we have then, uh, it's not in the words here. I don't think I put the visitation up there maybe because of um, just the sheer size of all of the text we're gonna be talking about here. But it says that David danced and leapt in front of the ark. Mary stayed there for three months and everybody was blessed. The word blessed is used twice in that passage. Now, I always ask people, how many of you immediately say, oh, that's second cha Samuel chapter six in the Bible, of course. Well, nobody says that except for very few people that I've ever heard said that. So they go now to, um, you go to second Samuel chapter six, and it says that David brought the Ark of the Covenant and he brought that Ark of the Covenant to the hill country of Judea. That's where this is, right here, where you have up on the thumb, right? They, he put the ark on a new cart, took it to the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. This is, we know where that was, and it's in the hill country of, of uh, Judea, same place right near where Mary went to visit Elizabeth, the hill country of Judea. Uzzah, second paragraph there, you got verse six, Uzzah reached out his uh, hand to steady the ark, and he died because you don't touch a holy thing. From that point on, it says that David took the ark into the hill country of Judea. David said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? Remember, Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Remember what John the Baptist did. He danced and leapt in the womb in front of the ark of the new covenant. Yep. It says that David danced and leapt in front of the ark of the old covenant. David danced and leapt. David left the ark in the house, see right there at the bottom there, the last line, the ark, uh, now it's uh, end of, yes, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom. How long? For three months. How long did Mary stay with Elizabeth? For three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his household, and the word blessed is used twice in the visitation, that it was blessed event. Now you've got all of these parallels. Don't think Mary didn't know those. And when she stopped to meditate about what happened to her there in the visitation, don't think that Mary didn't realize, oh my goodness, this is further confirmation that I am the Ark of the New Covenant. And in my womb are those three things. And it's the Ark came here to where I am now. And the same things happened as are happening to me. So you have Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. And Luke knew that when Luke he was a Gentile. Luke was the only Gentile writer in the New Testament. And yet he knew the Old Testament scripture so well that he embedded this story that you have up right now. He embedded that story into Luke chapter one of the visitation. And he did that so that you would know who and what Mary is. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. And then you take that a little further. What happens then in Revelation? When you get to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, can you bring up uh, chapter 11, 19, and Revelation 12, 1? Okay, here we say, I, I have it written out for you here. And the temple of the God, which is in heaven, was opened. This is John in the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. Yep. This is where we're going to go with our group in, in uh, October. We're going to this island of Patmos. I'm going to take you right where John was when he saw this revelation. And he saw the temple of God, which is in heaven, and it was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. Now, look at, wait a minute, we got to stop here. Say, wait a minute, the ark is gone. Didn't we just say that Indiana Jones can't even find it? In 586, the ark of the covenant was buried on Mount Nebo in the country today of Jordan. And it was hidden there because of the Babylonian captivity, and it's never been seen since. That was 600 years before John wrote the book of Revelation, six or 700 years, and John said he looks and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what in the world does John mean he sees the Ark of the Covenant? We'll then go to the next verse. A great sign appeared in the, in the heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars, she is with child. Who is this woman? Well, it's Mary. The Bible begins with a real man, a real woman, and a real snake. And the Bible ends with a real man, a real woman, and a real snake. Because in this passage, it says the devil who was from the Garden of Eden, the serpent of old, was there to fight this woman. Just the same as it told us in Genesis was going to happen. So here you have 
a sign appears in heaven. You see Mary, not only as the Ark of the Covenant, but John says, oh, I didn't just see her as the Ark of the Covenant, but I saw another great sign. She's the woman clothed with the sun, the new Eve. She is the queen of heaven. All of this is being revealed to John. I always ask just a little side note. Why did John get this revelation? Well, because, of course, John took care of this woman for Jesus for the next who knows how many years. And I think Jesus was saying, you want to know where mom is now, John? Take a look up in heaven. Thanks for taking good care of mom for him. Steve, I had never really pondered that that connection, but that is a, that's a beautiful connection, really. That's you, know why, you know why people don't see wow. it? See where I have the ellipsis, those three dots? Oh, yeah. That's the end of chapter 11. People close their Bible at that point, go to sleep. They come back in the next night and they open their Bible and they start reading John, Genesis, uh, Revelation 12, which says, a great sign appeared in the heaven. Those verses are not to be separated by chapter separations. Those have to be together because it's one line. The temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in the temple and a great sign appeared. It was the woman. Yeah. So you see there Mary being revealed not only as the queen, the woman of heaven, the new Eve with the new baby, but she is also the Ark of the Covenant. And and we we kind of also get that fulfillment that began all the way, way back when in the book of Genesis, where we read that the mother of the Messiah and the Messiah would be at enmity, which literally means if you look at the way that word excuse me, is utilized in the Greek Septuagint. It literally, and even in the Hebrew, literally means a, a, a more kind of mortal warfare. So you have that come to uh, come to fulfillment, even once we get to the book of Revelation, where we realize that Satan hates our blessed mother. Yep. Hates and, it's, her. And, and the thing that to think about here is that people say that in this passage, that woman represents Israel or the church because Jesus came through the church or through Israel. So it's not Mary. It's a symbol of Israel through which the Messiah came. But I would say it's both. We know how John writes using symbolism, but he also is very literal in many cases. So you have here, you can't have it both ways because in Revelation 12, it talks about the serpent of old who's in battle with the son of the woman and the woman. In that yeah. battle, the serpent of, of old, I don't, uh, do I have it in here? I don't think I have, oh yeah, uh, no, I don't have it in here for you. But it says that the serpent of old does battle against the woman and her son. Who is this? This is the, this is the battle that's been prepared, that's been said it's gonna happen all the way back in Genesis. There's gonna be enmity between the woman. If you go down uh, the Drake drain, throw down, see right there, verse eight. See, the, the war broke out in heaven, and there's a war going on. And her child, up above there, verse uh, five and six, the child was snatched away, and the woman fled. So on. But then right where you have in green there, and the war broke out. The dragon and his angels fought back, and they were defeated. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent, where was he referred to as a serpent? In Genesis, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world. He was thrown down. So here you have, in Revelation 12, you've got the woman, you've got her son, and you've got the devil that was in the garden. Tell me that's not Genesis chapter 3, 15. I will bring enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. There it's being played out right there in the book of Revelation. And so you have here, you cannot say that in this passage, it's a real Jesus. Nobody's going to deny that Jesus, the son, is, is real. It's not symbolic he's literal the real the devil a serpent of the uh, ancient serpent of the garden he's not symbolic he's real well if those two are real so is the woman in the bible it begins with a real man jesus a, a adam a real woman eve and a real devil and the bible ends with a real man the new adam and a new woman the new eve a real woman and the real devil the Bible ends the way it begins with a fulfillment. The Bible begins saying there's going to be a war between those three. And the Bible ends fully prophesying that that war is taking place. So there's Mary. That is Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, and Mary, the Queen of Heaven. There's no way you can get around that. And um, I know Protestants will bend over backwards to try to make it only symbolic, whatever. But it's quite clear 
that this is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter three, and it is a real man, a real woman, and a real snake in heaven, and Mary is the queen. Steve, incredible, incredible points there, because the, the, the attempt to kind of bend backwards to kind of um, minimize the fact that we have Mary here, it doesn't work. The earliest patristic interpretations here view Mary as the woman that appears here, and then it becomes even more problematic for, for those attempting to minimize Mary here. Are they going to also minimize the fact that she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron? Uh, if you go to Psalm 2, we go to Psalm 2, 7 to 9, right here. I will tell of the decree of the Lord, my, of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, literally rule them with a rod of iron. It is a messianic prophecy that comes to fulfillment right here. So who is the mother of the child that will rule with a rod of iron? It's Mary gave birth Mary. to a real child. Yep. So, I mean, to me, it's more problematic if you try to remove Mary from the context. You create all sorts of problems because we're clearly being told that is the fulfillment. Christ is that messianic fulfillment. So, and, and Mary is also seen here as the new Eve, too, because yep. she's the one from the garden. She's the one that the devil is now fighting against. The new Eve, the one who's going to be the new sinless even a new garden, so to speak. Now, one last thing, one other thing about this before we go to the Queen Mother, which we've already now begun to talk about because of this. While I'm doing that, go to First Kings chapter um, two nineteen. But before before we talk about that, you're going to have it on the screen. Oh, you can you know bring up my pages actually because it's there and I think oh, yeah, there we go. Better. Yeah, there we go. But first, before we talk about this, is that people accuse us of worshiping Mary. And I say to the people, well, Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. You couldn't touch it because it was a holy thing. If you did, like Uzzah, you'd fall, drop dead. Our, Mary is a holy thing. She's the Immaculate Conception. But the Jewish people never worshipped the box, the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't worship that Ark. They worshipped what was in it. When you went to the tabernacle in the Old Testament, you saw the Ark of the Covenant, but above it was billowing a cloud, and that was called the glory of God. It was the real presence of Christ in a, a God in a cloud. So you didn't come to worship the Ark, the box. You looked above the box, and you worshiped the cloud above the box. When we come to Mary, we are not worshiping Mary. We honor her like we honor the Ark of the Covenant, which was the most holy and reverenced utensil in the temple. It was holy in the Holy of Holies. Very special. No, everybody reverenced it, but they didn't worship it. They worshiped the glory cloud above it. And when we come to Mary, we recognize her, the Ark of the Covenant, and we, we, um, we cherish her, we respect her. But what do we worship? The baby in her arms. The baby in her arms. She's the seat of wisdom. He's sitting on her lap. She's the chair. We don't worship the chair. We worship that which is sitting in the chair on her lap. So that's it. Now let's go to 1 Kings 2.19. In the Old Testament, and we see it first here, most kingdoms had the queen was the wife of the king. That was the way it was in many, many, or most of the ancient kingdoms. The king had a queen and it was his wife. But in Judah, starting with Israel here with uh, King Solomon, the son of David, Jesus is, by the way, referred to as the son of David, right? Solomon is the primary physical son of David, but Jesus has the messianic title, son of David. And as the son of David, Solomon says his mother walked into his throne room. Normally, you don't do that. Read the book of Esther and see that the queen, even the queen, cannot walk into the throne room without the king's permission. He has to summon her first. So here you have... Queen, the king's mother walks into Solomon's throne room to speak to him. And instead of chastising her, the king arose to meet her, bowed before her. That means to prostrate, by the way, in Hebrew, prostrating himself. I think it's right flat on his face. And he sat on his throne. And then he had a throne set for his king's mother, 
for the king's mother, and she sat on his right hand. Now, this started something new in the kingdom of Judah, which lasted from this point around 300 to 586 BC. So roughly this went on for 300 and some years. Every time there was a queen, it was the mother. She was called the queen mother or the Geburah. And if you go through the books of first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles, those are the history of the Kings. You will find at least 30 times where it mentions the king and said, and his mother was. It doesn't mention the king ascending to the throne without telling you who his mother was. And the mother had tremendous authority. Queens were the intercessors for the people. They would come to the queen. She would take the request to the king. What does Mary do, right? We always call her the great intercessor. Even in John chapter 2, she's at the wedding feast. What does she do? She inter intercedes for the wedding guests. She goes to her son and said, the guests, the people here at the wedding, and we're all part of a wedding. Jesus said, we're going to be the great marriage feast of the Lamb. Mary is still intercessing for the wedding guests even to this moment to give us the wine, right? Which is the Eucharist. <clears throat> There's too many things that all tie together here, but yeah. And, and so the, the Gabura, I heard it's announced, pronounced also Gebura. 30 times in the Bible it's mentioned. The queen and his mother were taken into exile. The queen, there's only one time where it was his grandmother because for either the mother was bad and got kicked out or she was evil or died. But the one time it was the grandmother who was the queen mother. But you have the queen is the mother of the king. Mary was a queen mother, an intercessor, powerful authority. In fact, when the angel came to Mary, and said to her, you're going to have a son and his name will be Jesus and he will sit on the throne of his father, David. I'm sure that Mary said, oh my goodness, I'm going to be the queen of Israel. Oh my, <laughs> and that's why at the visitation, remember it says you have, you have lowered those with the crowns, the kings and queens, the royalty, you've lowered them and you've raised up your humble maidservant, raised her up to what? To the throne. Even at the even at the that uh, when when she's singing her Magnificat, she's talking about the royalty being cast down and the and her being the humble one being raised up, raised up to what? To the throne, of course. So Mary is the Queen of Heaven, and she is fulfilling. If Jesus is the King of Israel, then who's Mary? She's the Queen of Israel. And when Jesus, when Solomon assumed his mother up to sit at his right hand. Jesus, the quintessential king of Israel, assumed his mother up and seated her at his right hand. And we just saw it in Revelation 12 here that I saw the woman clothed with the sun. And only Jewish queens could have 12 stars. That was something that represented the Jewish queen. Why? Because the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So this can't be the queen of of uh, Babylon or the queen of Nineveh or the queen of Somalia or somewhere else. This is everybody knew in the early church. Any Jewish writer would know the queen wearing a crown with 12 stars was the queen of Judah. Which is very significant. Very, very significant. The fact that we have this, this vision, this sign that appears. And by the way, uh, where, where is this sign appearing? And the Greek is Uranus. In the heavens, we have Mary appearing in the heavens. And ever, I mean, really, to, to really unpack all of the incredible imagery we have there, Steve, we could do a whole show just on that amazing imagery that's there. Sure. But it all points to our blessed and immaculate mother being a very special saint, a very special figure in salvation history, doesn't it? Even when Jesus calls her woman, where is she mentioned? I wrote a book on John. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show off, not show off, but do a little advertisement here. My book on John, I go through all of these things. Can, you see, can they see it all right? I can't see it. But yeah, I'm know. going to briefly put it big. There we go. All right, good. Thank you. This is my book on the Gospel of John. Look at that. That thing is so thick, 450 pages. <laughs> anyway, shameless. Great book. But anyway, in here, I talk about how in Mary, I used to say as an evangelical, she's not so important. She's only really mentioned twice in the Gospel of John. Um, but I realized that it's not so much how often you're men mentioned, but where you're placed. Yeah. And she is strategically placed at the very 
first moment of his earthly ministry and the very last moment of his earthly ministry. She bookends the whole ministry of Christ. At the beginning, she's the intercessor at the wedding feast. And she says, do whatever he tells you. And how does he refer to her? Woman. He calls her woman. Now you get to the end of the Bible where, and the end of John. Where is Mary there? She's at the foot of the tree of death, which is going to bring about life. She's in a garden. The new Adam and Eve are in a garden at the last time that she meets, that we meet her in John's gospel, the end. And there he calls her woman again. Why does he call her woman? I think it's because he's pointing you back. John's always pointing you back to Genesis all through the book, to the, especially the Pentateuch. And in Genesis, it said, I will bring enmity between you and the woman. Who is the woman? Well, it's Mary. What does Jesus call her? Woman. I think he's um, intentionally pointing you back to that reference in Genesis, that Mary is this woman. She is the queen mother. She is the beginning of a new humanity. This is the woman. And um, I agree. Uh, it's, but, it's, but, but to, to briefly interrupt you, for the people that yeah. may want to know, Steve, where can they get that book of yours? Do you have it? Do you have a shop, or do they go on Amazon? Do, where, where can they get a hold of that? Don't go book? to Amazon. If we're we're grounded for a year, we're we're out of work for a year. If you buy it from us, you help us out a little bit, our family. There we go. Um, until we can get back to work, God's taking good care of us. Don't worry about that. But it it, it does help us. On my web page, CatholicConvert.com. CatholicConvert.com. If you go up to the top, it says products. That's my store. Everything is 15% off until Christmas with free shipping. And every book comes autographed. So you can get it. I've, I've signed all of the books. And there it is. It's uh, go right there to products, books. I got my audios, my DVDs on. There's there the book. There we go. Everything is 15% off for Christmas. And it comes signed with no uh, shipping cost. And I would also put another plug in, people, this right here is a great book, An Introduction to the Creeds. Great stuff. That's our stuff. new one. That's yeah. our new one. That is a new one. Great, beautiful, beautiful artwork there. Uh, check that out. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you pointed people to, to, your, um, to your store because I've had a lot of people ask before. A lot of people, I have to be honest with you, Steve, a lot of people don't like buying off Amazon. So... Having this option is a fantastic option, and even better, they can get it directly here, signed by you. Now, are they able to also get the Creed one? Would that be signed by you as well, or is yes, that of one course. not? Yes, Yeah, okay. and 15% off. It's a beautiful hardback book. That's why it's a little more expensive. It's a beautiful yep. hardback sleeve book. Very nicely laid out with very uh, nice quality paper, and it all comes signed. They're all signed, and uh, it's very, uh, very interesting book because it goes through the creed line by line and gives you all the background for it and the fathers of the church the scriptures the catechism it's really a nice read easy read beautiful beautiful book yeah definitely people check that out and the reason i um the Both reason the we're recommending it is because uh, you bring up a great point there steve to understand the gospel of john to, to really know what he's talking about there in chapter two, you have to have a, a, a good grasp of the Old Testament. And as you know, and I can tell people here, uh, Steve's book on, on, on John is fantastic. Um, John was a great writer in Greek. He was very intelligent. It's written in an incredible kind of Greek. John would have wanted and would have known that his audience would have known where he was hearkening to. Isn't that correct? Of course. In fact, how does he begin the book? In the beginning. What other book starts with in the beginning? Genesis. Yep. So John is telling you from the very first three words of his book, if you want to understand my book that begins with in the beginning, you have to understand the first book that starts with in the beginning. So he's even letting you know from the very beginning that you have to, no pun intended, <laughs> that you have to understand Genesis before you're going to understand his. What an incredible point. Really, really incredible point. I mean, there, there's really so much, um, so much to unpack, uh, Steve. And maybe, maybe we can briefly cover one more point. Yep. And we can even do another show because there's so much to uncover, isn't there? 
there is. There's just so much to uncover. So when, when we talk about, I mean, because I know the audience would love to hear this. When we talk about Mary as daughter of Zion, exactly what do we mean by that? Well, in the Old Testament, by the way, remember I mentioned the all of those things that were in the Ark of the Covenant? Yep. It's Hebrews 9, 4. And Hebrews 9, the, 4. There we go. Yep. Hebrews 9, 4. And as I get older, I my mind does not remember things like it did when I was uh, 20. So see there where it says that the golden, that it, the, the in the Holy of Holies, it stood a golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. By the way, being laid over with gold represents divinity, the, but uh, royalty, I should say, represents royalty, but also purely immaculate because the gold is so pure. It is so purged to be pure gold. And inside of it was a golden urn holding manna, Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. In Mary's womb is the word of God, the uh, bread of life, not the manna, but the bread of life. In her womb is the real priest and in her womb is the word of God in flesh, not in stone. And what was over top of the ark? The cherubim of glory. So don't mess with the ark. <laughs> but but I, 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 thought, I thought we couldn't make graven images, Steve. I know that's God forgot, you know, when he, and it was only in Exodus chapter 20 that he said, do not make any images of anything above the earth, on the earth or below the earth. And then he must have forgot because five chapters later, he tells them to make a graven image of angels out of one piece of gold. And then he forgot again when they went and sinned and the serpents came in the wilderness. And he said, quickly, make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a pole. Oh no, now we got to make another image of something on the earth. We got to make image of, oh my goodness, God forgot again. The point is, I'm not being facetious and making fun of God and his memory. What I'm doing is saying that the image was not the important thing. It was that you don't make an image and bow down to worship it, which is what the pagan nations did. Amen, brother. Amen. We have, um, Maybe we could take a, a few questions before we wrap up and uh, let the people know we will do more. We'll definitely do more. Okay. Um, well, we, I want to also let them know that our conference coming up. We're yes, doing a conference. definitely. And Put you, that plug in. You and your buddy, remind me of his name. I forget. Father Coppes. You and, uh, and him are going to do a talk on typology. Understanding the Bible through typology. That's going to be your topic in our conference coming up. We have a conference coming up January 8th through 10. There's never been anything like it. I, I got the idea laying in bed one time. Go to virtual Catholic conference. There it is. And this was my idea. This is my conference, believe it or not. And um, when you look at the guests of speakers, it's unbelievable. Do you have a way of going scrolling down maybe and seeing who the speakers Definitely. are? Definitely. Go there. See, there's my. It's my conference. It's uh, and and we're gonna have all everything to do about the Bible. It's everything Bible for the Catholic. So go click on presenters there. See, look. Oh yeah, scroll down. Look at the people who are gonna be speaking there. Go a little more. Look at that. Wow. That's all the speakers that have already agreed to come to my conference and speak for us, and your name's on there too. There it is, right, right there. there. See, you're gonna be talking about understanding the Bible through typology. Joseph Pierce over in the third column is going to be doing the Bible as literature. We've got the Bible and archaeology. Just And these are not all of them. There's more have signed up since now. So January 8 through 10, it's going to be everything Bible for the Catholic. It's free. We're going to have a lot of, uh, I'm going to be demonstrating Bible Catholic software to use, software for the Bible called Verbum. I'm going to be doing an interview with uh, Dr. Peter Kraft, an hour live interview discussion also with my bishop. And everybody's taking a topic about the Bible. Yep. Gary Mashuda is going to do the Deuterocanonicals. John Bergsma is going to do the Dead Sea Scrolls. You got, you got, a, you got Dr. Scott Hahn as well, I can tell. Scott Hahn, Jeff Cavins. Father Peter Fessio, Craig, Mike Aquilina. Wow. Father Larry Richards. Deacon Burke Sivers, Kimberly Hahn, Patrick Madrid, Father Frank Pavone, Ralph Martin, Father Spitzer, Joseph Pierce, Father Chris Alar, Roy Showman's going to do the uh, Bible from a Jewish perspective, Terry Barber, 
I, it's just uh, the people that signed up to do this was just an incredible list of people. Marcus Grodi from the Journey Home. This is amazing. This is a list of um, like wow. This is going to be a mind blowing conference. You got Teresa Tomio as well, uh, Matthew Leonard, uh, Doctor Edward Street. This is going to be Rod Ben. This is going to be a ton of fun. And oh, right is- now, you, I'm looking here. Right now, people can go to virtualcatholicconference.com, look for the link here, click it. And if they don't register, which they've got to register, if they don't register, they're going to be missing out on a ton of material, aren't they? It is, and it's free. Now, if you want this material to last forever, I think there's a, a, a premium fee that you can pay, but the conference itself is going to be for free. And all of this stuff is going to, see there we got Jeff Cavins talking. Yep. So um, go to either my website. You can go to my website, catholicconvert.com. If you go there, that's good because if you use the link I have, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So go to catholicconvert.com and click that link. You're going to have a link up there soon for yours because yep. you've got your own link. So um, go, to, um, go to William's site. Sign up through his link. Yeah, and in fact, I am going um, to Catholic Convert. Convert. Go to either my page or go to Steve's page. You will find a way. Um, and uh, do you have right, it? Here it is, right here. Right hand side, click on that, and it'll take you right to the link. There See? we go. So go check it out, everybody. Sign up. Um, I mean, what is it going to cost you? It's going to cost you 30 seconds of your time. And you'll be Everything getting Bible for the Catholic Catholics are afraid of the Bible. They think it's too big. They're... This is going to be everything Bible for the Catholic. It's going to get you started. It's going to make you proud. It's our book. Yep. Amen. So we have, um, you want to do the last one? The daughter of, uh, yeah, let's do daughter Zion. of Zion. Let's do that Go back one. To the last part there. Yeah. Right here. Uh, go up a little more. Oh, you know, that's a, that's the older version. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got it right here. All right. Here we go. There we go, daughter of Zion. Well, we see, say, look at Isaiah 37 there. He says, Assyria despises you, Israel. He's referring to Israel. Zion, by the way, is a nickname for Jerusalem. Yep. It's like saying Washington is a nickname for the United States in a way. Okay, so... Right in the middle there, Isaiah 37. Assyria despises you. She scorns you. The virgin daughter of Zion. The virgin daughter of Zion. Zion is already in great sin. She's already had idols and everything, which is why Assyria has taken her over. But God still refers to her as the virgin daughter of Zion. And Zephaniah refers to, O daughter of Zion, sing aloud and short. Why? Because the king of Israel is coming to you. He's in your midst. Well, Mary, because Israel, Jerusalem, Zion, they're all kind of synonymous, disappointed God. She was his daughter, and she disappointed him. She played the harlot with idols and other gods. So what does God do? He chooses one girl, and he personifies, uses her to personify all of Israel. She becomes the daughter of Zion. Mary is the daughter of Zion who personifies all of the people of God in a way he's starting over with this one girl who is Israel. She is a daughter of Zion. She's a daughter of Israel. She represents all of Jerusalem, all of Israel. And down at the bottom, it says the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. O daughter of Zion, meaning Jerusalem. Well, how much more fitting in the new covenant daughter of Zion in the midst of whom the Lord will dwell not just nearby, but bodily. She is now free from all sin. She's the new virgin daughter of Jerusalem, the virgin daughter of Zion, who was sinless, the virgin daughter. Mary now becomes the same virgin, sinless daughter of Zion. And God doesn't just come and dwell among them. God comes and dwells within her. Just like Jesus coming to dwell inside of Jerusalem, The word of God indwelled Mary, the Immaculate Conception. She became the archetype for Israel and the archetype for all of the church, holy and without blemish. And I like the line right there where I scroll up a little more. 
scroll down a little more. This is the catechism says in paragraph 722, the Holy Spirit prepared Mary by his grace. It was fitting that the mother of him to whom the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, Jesus is God, should herself be full of grace, Jesus. Mary, she was by sheer grace conceived without sin, the most humble of creatures, the most capable of welcoming the inexpressible gift of the Almighty. It was quite correct for the angel to greet her as daughter of Zion. She is starting over again. God is going to start over again. Zion disappointed him. Zion sinned against him. Zion was sent into captivity. Now he's picking a new young girl who is going to personify Israel and the Holy One of God will not only be in her midst, he will be within her. And she starts over again as the new Eve, the Queen Mother, the Ark of the Covenant, the burning bush, the new Jerusalem. All of that is embodied in Mary. So why do we count Mary as being special? Well, if you haven't figured that out in the last hour, <laughs> then I, I would say uh, I'm not sure what you should do. <laughs> I agree. No, if, if you haven't encountered that yet, you got to hear the show again because it was full of what I like to call meat and potatoes. A lot of really real substance to really sustain you. Go back and it's hear biblical. it over again. And it's biblical. That's what I had to be for me as a Baptist. The Catholic Church had to be biblical or I'm not getting anywhere near it. And to realize how biblical the Catholic Church is and the catechism is, it drew me right into the Catholic Church. And that's why I want to do the Catholic Conference uh, and journey into the Bible. And uh, thrilled about that. Thrilled about that. Everybody, I promise you, we will have Steve on again. If I don't have him here on the channel, I'll have him on Reason and Theology or somewhere. You've got to go to Virtual Catholic Conference or go actually go to catholicconvert.com. Click the link, sign up for that conference. It is 100% free. And I'd like to remind people as well, uh, my book that I wrote on Mary Very has good. an endorsement from my brother, Steve. So check that book out as well. Um, you can find that book as well. Check out everything Steve has got on his shop. Thank you, Steve. Brother, it was a pleasure having you on. We've got to do it again. Well, it was fun. I always enjoy being with you, William. We've been friends a long time. A very long time. Steve has been my brother since I first got into this many moons ago. And I've got to say, Steve, you look like you're getting younger as the years go by. What is your secret, brother? I I don't know. I, I try to eat good and not too much. We exercise and I've got a wife that makes my life stress-free. Yeah. What a wonderful wife. I've, I've, I've seen your wife before. Wonderful lady. But I also have to say that I think I have a good, good genetics because my mother is 99 years old right now. She was diagnosed about eight days ago with COVID, but you wouldn't oh. know it. She has no symptoms. She laughs at it and says, I may have COVID, but I don't have any symptoms and I'll be back in my regular room again soon. So my 99-year-old mother survived COVID without even being uh, affected by it. Now, I know that's not the case with everybody, and I'm so sorry for people who get it, and it yep. has a bad effect. But just to say that my mom is 99 years old, and I, and I think my dad died at 94 years old, so I think I've got good genetics. Incredible genetics, brother. And the Lord keep you healthy for many, many, many more years and allow us to remain brothers and allow us to do ministry together for many more years. Brother, I look forward to having you on Good. again. Thank you, William. We'll do it you, again. God you bless. Take care, Merry brother. Christmas. We'll, we'll, Merry None Christmas of that happy well. holiday stuff. It's Merry Christmas. Oh, by the way, when people say happy holidays, I laugh because what does that word mean? It means holy day. Yep. So whether they, even when they try to cheat and say happy holidays, they're really saying happy holy day. Same thing as Christmas. <laughs> There's no way around it. They're just too stupid to realize what they're saying. You can't escape the meaning of the season that is christ he yes. is the reason for the incredible season brother you have yourself a blessed rest Great. of your day will you send me a link to this show when it's when you have it up i'd like i to sure will in just a moment it should be it should be available on youtube probably within 10 minutes after we end and i will get you that link brother thank, thank you very much william thank you brother talk to you soon